in here, but this is the scandal of the cross, part four. And I'm going to go back to our start scriptures in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. I'll start at verse 18, read down to verse 25. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, you could read that. That word perish, there's the same word that Jesus used in Luke 15 uh, with the lost, lost sheep. Perish, lost, same word. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Before I go on, I, you guys realize every time we read scriptures, most of the time we always think of somebody else who's wise. Instead of ourselves. I mean, do you read scripture like that? You point, well, that's him. I mean, he knows everything. And God's going to. Guys, today it's us. It's us. Yeah, that's all it might be. Jesus called. I need to ask you about today's lesson. Yeah. I'm just kidding. He says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolishness the wisdom of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now listen to what he says. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You, are you hearing what this is saying? By your wisdom, you didn't know God. You can't know. And here it says it pleased God. I could go all the way back to the garden, the way things, the way, you know, we, oh, I, I better not even get, chase that lower rabbit right there. I get y'all messed up. Listen, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching. And I guess maybe that's why I'm up here, because I can be a fool. The foolishness of preaching. To save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. That's the way it is. People want a sign. You know, as a church going over to Tracy, signs and wonders. Not to get signs and wonders, but it's all they look for. Signs and wonders. What if you don't get a sign? You know, it ain't always here's your sign. And to, and to the Greeks, you know, they're, they're, they're seeking wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block, a scandal. Unto the Greeks, foolishness. Now that word foolishness, we, we said the last two or three weeks, that word foolishness there could be interpreted, you would have to be a moron to believe it. But unto them which are called, Jews and Greeks, listen to this, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God, the thing that seems so foolish, such a stumbling blow, uh, stone is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. And I know, guys, you've heard many different sermons on that, on those verses, but I guarantee you, you ain't heard like I'm going to preach it today. He is saying God in Christ hanging on a cross is wiser than me. And then he says the weakness of God is stronger than me. The weakness of God is stronger than me. That's kind of where I want to kind of look at today because we, we saw Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Can you, I mean, God's power on display is what? The cross. Can you get that? I mean, that's a scandal. You go around to the tribes of the world, all the other religions of the world, tell me about your God, tell me about his power. 
Oh, he moves mountains. He speaks, and if so, and he does all this stuff, they all got that. Well, what is the demonstration of your God's power? Beat to a pulp, naked, hanging on a cross. What's the, how smart? What's the wisdom of God on display? Jesus hanging on a cross. That's foolishness. I mean, how could that be the power of God? How could that be the wisdom of God? I'm, I'm telling you, how, it's a scandal when we really get down to it. But he's introducing here the, the power of God as part of the scandal. You know that word, uh, the uh, foolishness, uh, the stumbling stone, that's the word offense. It's the word scandal. Scandal on. And, and it means that which causes me offense. When I, when I look at it, I get angry. I want something else. I, I don't want this as a display. I want something else. It doesn't fit with my humanity. My humanity looks at God's power and says that's weakness. Right? I mean, so I back off. I'm not sure if I want this. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to, we're going to go down this road today. And, and I just I got a feeling we, we've all been, been guilty, but just, just stay with me. So where does this word power begin with? Power, power. We got to go all the way back to the garden, to the to the to the fall, the 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 lie. That's where we began to misunderstand everything. You realize that that was the beginning of the great misunderstanding. What was the lie? Hey, you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know God is really withholding something from you. You know He, he because He knows as soon as you eat this tree, you'll have power. You'll be like God. So, you know, go ahead. I mean, you know how God... Today, when people still believe that, they believe God is withholding something from you. So he says, Adam, go ahead, declare your independence of God, and you'll see. Just go ahead, eat. You'll find yourself just like God. So since that day, man has looked... That God has almighty power, almighty glory, something to be attained, right? When nations try to control other nations, how do they do it? Power, might. I mean, where is all the money in America spent? Defense. It's not defense, it's offense. You don't do what we say, we're, we're coming in. I mean, when's the last time somebody tried to invade us, really invade us. 1941, uh, you know, the Japanese. 1941, but yet we call it the defense. Defense is when you're defending something. We're, we're on offense. But anyway, why? So we can go around and control nations. And how do we control nations? Power. And then glory. I mean, what's our view of glory? I mean, come on. This all started with the Catholic Church. We're going to build a church. It's got to be the highest and mightiest and most beautiful building in the whole world. I mean, we, surely we can't have a president living in a shack. He's got to live in the White House. I mean, the King of England, or the Queen of England, where do they live? Do they live out here in, in Green Hill somewhere or, you know, wherever? No, they live in Buckingham Palace. Glory, power, it's on display. And when you, when you get filthy rich and you become a multi-billionaire, do you buy a double wide? Heck no. Power, glory, it's got to be on display, right? And that's the way we view it. But yet here the power of God, is a, it's a scandal. In the world of religion, and certainly in America, it is a scandal. When we talk about the power of God, it's weakness. It doesn't fit in with our idea, with the world's ideal of power. And again, I'll say, what is the world's ideal of power that, that arises out of the garden and out of the lie? Uh, so we've got to look at power and glory. What is it? It's, it's bigness, right? Bigness. It's, it's glory. It's, it's this pomp and I mean, 
Do you know what church Jesus preached in? I mean, y'all are looking at me kind of smiling, but I mean, I'm just asking you the question. You know what, you know what denomination Jesus was? I mean, you know, did he go down there and, and go over with the Baptists on Sunday and say, man, they got the biggest church. This guy preached out of a boat. He preached out of a field somewhere. Now, that doesn't seem right. I thought you had to go down to the temple and be in the, you know, in the big pomp and glory, and he's preaching out of a fishing boat. That sounds crazy, don't it? I mean, it's a scandal. He didn't wear all the stuff that the priest wore. I mean, did you ever go back and look at the holy garments of the high priest? And Oh, my goodness, he didn't do none of that. But power and glory in America, it's bigness, it's success, it's the ability to command, the ability to influence others, the ability to make others do what I say. That's power, right? I can make all others do my will. I've got, what, what do we call it? Clout. He's got clout. Others will bow when I speak. It's the idea, and guys, I can show you this in Scripture. It's the idea that when I walk, others walk ahead and say, make way. Now, you think I'm being crazy here, guys, but I was in the military. And you realize we would be standing in the chow line. And if a high-ranking officer came through, everybody would holler, gang way. And we had to get out of the way and let the person with power walk through. That's the way of the world, guys. Even in the scriptures, when, when, when Absalom was pronounced king, self-pronounced, what did he do? He had people run ahead of him. Long live the king and shout, here comes the king. Long live the king. Today, when people do the same thing, you know, I read these stories of these big time preachers. They got people carry the Bible into church with them, carry the briefcase around. Go open the door for them. Drive them around. Fly them around. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. Right? You think Jesus would have done that? You think Jesus would have been in the limo? Jesus would have been on his own personal jet? I mean, y'all think that? That Jesus would have been preaching in the great big time churches, you know? 40,000 people. I'll go there. It's big. It's pop. I can put my display on power. Then you had Jesus operating. I mean, he dealt with widow women, tax collectors, bums, blind people, people that didn't have jobs. It's a scandal. You think he's changed? It's a scandal. It's a scandal. But see, today in, our, in, in the church world, if we don't have the biggest church around and the most people, you're a failure. Right? I mean... That church over there is successful. They got 500 people. They got, they're a whole lot more successful than, than what you are. You only got 25. But see, that's what we think. Because power comes through this grid of human thinking. So this guy here with power, he's got power. He's to be respected. Hey, I'm here. I'm here to be reckoned with. Do as I say. Move over or you'll regret it. Isn't that how God has preached? You better move over. You're going to regret it. You'll pay the consequences. Now, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to come right down to you. It's always associated with money. Money's power. Paul said the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, that's a mighty statement. What do you think of when you think of power? Think of money. Think of dollar signs. Man who's got power has got money. Man who's got money has got power. So money is involved, and, and it's interesting that in the Old Testament, all, all, of, the, all of the gods that were there, only, only one God makes it through to the New Testament. You know what that God was? The God of Mammon. There's no mention of Baal in the New Testament, no mention of Moloch or Ashtaroth or any of the gods of Egypt. There's only one God mentioned, the God of money, Mammon. Mammon, it's, it's the God of the trust of money. 
It makes it to the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's, I mean, I would think what Jesus' first sermon here, he's preaching on the Sermon on the Mount would be pretty important. And he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. And that word serve there means to serve someone or something as a God. So he wasn't just saying it was a thing. He said, you placed it as a God and equated all power with it. Money. Money. Money is, is here as a powerful deity for those who worship power. As humans understand power. Got to have the money so that I can have the power. Do you know, in the United States, you cannot even run for president unless you're a millionaire. I mean, this was set up all a long time ago. You got to have money before you can even run. Common person can't do it. Because we want somebody with power. Look at the symbols that we use to describe our nation. Y'all know what the symbol is? That if somebody sees this symbol around the globe, they'll know. What's our symbol? Eagle. You know what the symbol of England is? Lion. How about Russia? Y'all know that. A bear. China. Dragon. I mean, these ain't household pets here. We don't, you know, America, the symbol of America is not a kitty cat. You know, it's not a possum. The symbol of Russia is not a blue jay. You hear what I'm saying? It's power. It, had, it goes with it. You better watch out. I'm here. And if you don't, you'll feel my claws. You'll feel my talons. You'll feel my power. You better look out. And what do we do? We go around to these nations. I'm just telling you. I mean, guys, I, what I always want to do is make sure you understand there's no separation here. It's not church on Sunday and then the world. I'm talking about power all around. What do we do with nations who don't do what we say? We cut them off. You will do what we say or we won't trade with you. We'll starve you out. You know, that's how we do it, isn't it? Am I telling you the truth? If we don't invade you, we will starve you out. We're taking you out of the UN. You will feel our eagle's talons. You will know. I mean, we're a nation of power. You better respect us. I mean, that's, that's the ways of the world, guys. That's the way it is. We're driven to achieve this aura of power. And if we don't, we, we pretend that we've achieved this aura of power. And I'll give us one word to describe that. It's called debt. People work crazy hours. You know, most homes nowadays got at least two jobs between them. Sometimes three and four jobs in one home. Why? To get more money. To have more power. What's the old thing? We can't make it. We need power. Why do we need power? So, so that I can do what I want when I want. Right? I want that power. I want to be able to do what I want when I want. So that I can go to the lake on Sundays and go fishing. Why well, I want that power. I want that option. Preaching to me about being a slave of the Lord. I don't want that sermon. Don't preach that sermon to me today. I want the sermon of, I want power so I can buy boats so I can go fishing when I want to go fishing. I've worked all week. I deserve it. Right? I deserve it. Worked hard this week. I got it. If I want to go fishing, I'll go fishing. If I don't have it, I'll pretend. I'll lie, I'll mask, I'll bluff my way to think, make you think I've got it. You might think i got money. Oh, look, Jim, I mean, good Lord, he pulls up here and daggone. You know, he's got a brand new Cadillac out there. Man, he must be loving, must be doing well. Never mind, about four months from now, they ain't going to get repo because he can't make a payment. Never could make a payment. I don't know why they financed for it. They ain't got to do nickels to rub together, but I got to look good, right? Do you know how many people around here are that way? All over the place. Power. That's the way of the world. And if I, if, when I don't have it, 
Or you've got more, then I envy you. Isn't that what we want to do? I, I envy you, man. One of these days, I want a house like that. Why? Because I associate that house with power. I associate that car with power. But one of these days, I want to have that. Why? So that I will have the power. I will have the respect. We've, we've, I want people to envy me. We've got our icons of power. We're, we're, part of the, we're part of the icon of power. I mean, the icon of power is America around the world. We're part of that. And it seeps over into the church, guys. I've been telling you, it comes over into the church. It affects our kids. How does it affect our kids? There's so many verses I wish I could go, but y'all just hear and, and what I'm saying. But we don't allow our kids to do what they want to do, to be free thinkers. To be free, you've got to be successful. You've got to be number one. You know, I've been a part of that. Don't play games for fun anymore. We play games to win. I've done all that, guys. Power. Power. We want our kids to be successful. Why? So that we can tell our neighbors how successful our kids are. So that I'll have power. So I can tell you how good I raised my kids. I mean, people will brag quickly. Hey, my son works for him. Hey, my son works. Hey, my daughter, she's doing good. How many people do you see jump up and down and say, well, hey, my daughter's in jail? No, nah, because then that makes you look like a failure. You don't have power. If you really had power that they would be successful. You, you see what I mean? So this drive comes all the way down into our kids. We're terrified of being ordinary. Terrified of being ordinary. Whatever our audience is, and we all have an audience, and in our audience, in our little world, in our audience, we must succeed. We must be successful. We must reach the top. I know, guys, I've been there. I mean, I worked on a railroad. The first thing I wanted to do was go as high as I could, and I was climbing up what we call it, climbing up the corporate ladder. Right? Been there, guys. I'm not telling you something that I haven't done. Something I'm telling on somebody else, I have been there. Climbing up the corporate ladder. Why? Because I wanted to do good for the company? No, I didn't give a hoot about the company. I wanted the power. And the, with the higher I got, the more money I got, the more power that I would have. Railroad was just the, uh, the means to an end. Ultimately, I wanted the power. We're terrified of being mediocre. Terrified of being ordinary. Terrified. There's something in human flesh that says I must be noticed. I've got to leave a mark in the world. Somebody's got to know I was here. And listen, guys, drive by a bridge. Somebody's painted John was here on the bridge. Why? I've got to be noticed. I see it on walls, you know. Sam was here. Good. I've left my mark. I work on the railroad, guys. I work in these little, you know, some people call them silver boxes, these cases. I'll open up this case and it'll say, installed by Jim Moore was here, 1992. Got to leave my mark. I've got, they got to know I was here. You ever watch sports? People hold up signs so they can be noticed. I was here. Look, I, I, I seen you at the ball game. Yeah, I was noticed. I mean, it, it feeds the frenzy. That's why they take the camera and pan the audience. Feeds the frenzy. We need to be noticed. Need to be accepted. Need others to tell me that I'm okay. I need human acceptance. You realize, guys, we were created to look into the face of God to find our acceptance? 
That's what Paul said. I see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You were created to look into the face of God to find your acceptance. And what have we done? We're bent people, bent over from the line. Remember the woman, bent over 18 years? So we're bent over and we look in the face of others to find our acceptance. Causes all of our trouble. I've got to be accepted. What do kids do at school? They're raised up, bent over, and I've got to be accepted by my classmates. I've got to be accepted by my parents. I've got to be accepted on the bus. I've got to be accepted. Please accept me. I'll do whatever it takes. Why do we have gangs around the world? Because somebody's looking for acceptance. There's a longing. And that acceptance will never be filled except in the face of Jesus Christ. But we're bent over. Abraham, lift up your eyes and look. Lift up, that means we're bent. If we have to be told to lift up, it means we're bent. Our view is downward. So I'm coming to you for my acceptance. It's why people get on these stupid reality shows. Why do they get on there and make complete idiots of themselves for 30 minutes? You ever watch those things? Shame on you. I said that for you. Everybody raised their hands. <laughs> but I mean, these people are blooming idiots. I mean, why would you get on a show with Survivor and so, you know, do the stupid stuff? And then, you know, I've seen these people get on TV and watch them pour spiders on them. You ever seen them do that? Pour spiders on them and snakes and have to eat gooky stuff. And, you know, all, why would they do that? So I can be noticed. I need my fame. How many children are mean just to be noticed? How many are in jail because they wanted attention? I'm going to say something right here that might blow your mind. How many are sick beyond the healing of God? When I say beyond the healing of God, they won't receive the healing of God because that's their identity. This is my sickness. This is mine. I mean, I don't know how I'd be identified if I wasn't identified as. Why do you think Jesus, Jesus had to ask, will you be made whole? Do you really want to be well here? Because I don't want to intrude. I mean, you've been here on this map for 38 years. You seems to me like you like it. I told you this is a scandal. It's a scandal when we really, really get, get down to it. I mean, why do we gossip? Guys, you can be sucked into gossiping so quickly. And, and I mean, I, I find myself, I'm right there, talking about all again. <laughs> quickly. Yeah, I know. Why do we gossip? Because gossip is the peak of power. I know something you don't know. Sounds like kids don't, I know something you don't know, do die, do die. But yet in my sovereignty, I may share what I know with you. I've got power. I've got power. So we all have an audience. They know what we're up to and we need their applause. We want their applause. An audience that will relate to what I'm doing and envy me because I'm a success. I mean, I, I want the power. When I get the power, I want you to envy me. That way I'll know that I have power when you envy me. I want their respect. I want to fit in. I, I want to belong then there's another audience. That's the immediate audience. There's another, another audience that many people deal with. That, that's an audience of, of, of moms and dads, uh, uncles, whoever, that aren't even here anymore. They're dead and gone, but yet the audience is still here. You're still trying to please them. You can still hear them saying, you'll never amount to anything. Now, their dad and God been, been dead for 20 years. But you still hear the voice, you'll never amount to anything. So you spend your whole life trying to prove to them.
them who are dead and gone, that you will amount to something. You will achieve this power. Because they had a view of power and you wasn't going down that road, so here you go. We've got to show them that we did something. And then how about the most wretched creatures in the whole world? Yo, brothers and sisters. They're wretches. I've got three of them. I don't know if you guys got any brothers and sisters or not, but I mean, how about the one that's always prettier than you? The one that's always smarter. The one that can always run faster and do it better. And here you are. Always trying to prove you know what I mean? I've got to prove I got power. Then what happens when you fail? That's why people turn to drugs and alcohol and all the other stupid stuff that they do because they want to numb the pain of being a failure. What do we have around the world here? What do we have uh, around the United States? We got more drug use than in the United States and all other countries combined. You know, I talked to a cop the other day. He worked in Bluefield. He moved down to Richland. I, I worked with him all day out here in Richland. And he told me we got more drugs in Richland than they got in Bluefield. I would have never believed that. He said, I'm telling you what, it's an infestation. We got a church on every corner. What, I mean, what is it? Power and I fail and I just I want to numb it out. Can't stand the pain of failure. And then when they get stoned, what do they feel? Power. And then, on top of that, guys, i got to bring this over into the church. Then, on top of that, I hear the gospel, the 21st century gospel. I hear you're in Christ. I hear you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I hear you're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. I hear that when the Holy Spirit has come, you shall receive power. Right? Power. That's why we got to have power. So then we jump back and say, I'm taking our city for God. I'm fighting the devils. I'm taking our city. I'm claiming it. Power. God is just wanting somebody to get the power. And then it comes over into the church this way and then somebody gets on TV and says, you want real power? Here's real power. Give me a hundred dollars and God has got to give you a thousand back. Power. Now I've got real power. I can make God do what I want. I found a secret. If I do this, he has to do that. I've got power. I'll be his God, Kathy. I've got it figured out. I can manipulate God. Isn't that the ultimate lie? But buddy, they're right on TV, living in big mansions, flying in big jets because of this very system. Power, the world's power. You can really manipulate God. If you will send me a hundred dollars, God has to give you a thousand. I love this God. I trade with this God all day. This is great. But you know what really happens? The guy telling you the lie is buying him a new jet. You're out a hundred bucks. That's the truth. And then we wonder why. Then I get angry. God didn't come through. God let me down. Then, then in the church we, we, we talk about the gifts of power. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. What is all this, guys? It's taking the gospel. These things are true. These things I just said, they're true, but we're taking them and putting them through the lens, through the understanding of what we think power is. That's right. I mean, what are these scriptures? Don't forget these scriptures. It's a stumbling block. It's foolishness. We run it through the grid of what we call human power. But we miss it completely. That makes religious, re, that makes religion the most dangerous because we're dealing with spiritual abilities here. 
These things I read, you're in Christ. It's true. You're more than conquerors. It's true. You should lay hands on the sin. It's true. But not in the ideal of human power. You know what a cult is? Not a cult, but a cult. I guess same thing. It's the desire. It's the desire to know that which is hidden and secret. The desire to know what others don't know and to use that knowledge to have power over them. That's why so many people want to be preachers. Because if I'm a preacher, by God, I've got power. You will respect me because I'm a man of God. Right? We uh, The desire for this hidden, secret knowledge. Let me tell you something, guys. People who are avid Bible readers, what is the first book you always want to read in the Bible? Kathy's smiling over here. She knows. You want to know Revelation. That's where everybody goes, though, isn't it? Because we got to understand the hidden knowledge. And then people get on TV with their great explanations of the book that they don't have a clue about and give this great knowledge and people buy their books hand over fist because they've got power. They know when the Antichrist is coming. They know when the end of the world is coming. I mean, you know, they might not know the exact second, but they'll get you pretty close. People's buying it, buying it, buying it. Because if I buy it, I'll tap into his power. I'll get the power that he's got. And then I'll know. And then when, then when something happens on CNN, I'll say, Ha-ha, I've got the power. I know the secret. And I might share it with you. And you'll come to me and you'll envy me. And you'll say, Jim knows everything. He knows exactly what's going on. He's got the power. I mean, there's the songs out there. I've got the power. I've got the power. Big hits. That's why so many get on the latest power bandwagon. Whatever the whatever the latest power bandwagon the church is doing, they get on the power bandwagon. Anything for the power. Now, like I told you, all this stuff is God's gift, but it's all used the wrong way. It's all passed through the grid of human power. So now we've talked about our other audience and our, uh, now we've got a new audience. I'll say it this way. And the, 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 the new audience is the church, which interprets everything in terms of earthly power and its dangers. That's why everybody is wanting the most important ministry. Everybody wants to change the world. Is anybody called to lose their life in rich lands? That's unimportant. That's unimportant. I mean, I think about people like Mother Teresa called to lose her life in the streets of Calcutta. Wow, what a glamour. Dealing with people with AIDS and leprosy and every kind of foul disease that you could think of. I mean, why didn't she stay at the Vatican? Anyone called to just be an ordinary church member filled with the glory of God? An ordinary church member. What is so ordinary about a church member that is filled with the glory of God? Prophet, ever prophesy in church, thus says the Lord, thou shalt be ordinary. Who do you think is going to pay that prophet to come back? The prophet gets up on the pulpit and he starts prophesying. Have you guys ever heard a prophet say, thus says the Lord, thou shalt be ordinary? No, he'll go out of business. He's got to prophesy, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt have a wonderful ministry. Thou shalt be a big time preacher. Thou shalt heal thousands. Thou shalt do this. Thou shalt do this. Not, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt be an ordinary housewife. Thou shalt raise your kids in utter quietness. I go to church every week and die at a good old age. Who wants that? There's no excitement there. You see what I mean? So there's a desire here. The prophet comes to town, everybody's sitting there. I wonder what he's going to speak over me. I wonder, there must be some hidden power in me. He's going to speak this power over me and draw it up and then skippity doo dah, I'm going about my way. Here we go. We're 
terrified God will do nothing important through me. I mean, am I the only one that has these fears, guys? That I'll live and die unnoticed in the Christian world? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? That we'll just be ordinary? So what do we do? We work and we work and we work. You know, there's a rest left of the people of God, but yet we work and we work and we work. Trying to do what? Trying to get noticed. Look at all these programs we got going on. Look at all the things we're doing. Look, hey, God, notice us. And, and some preachers around, I know, guys, it seems like they can just make God happen. You know, I, I watch these things, guys. I do. I mean, you know, I'm on the Internet, and I do the radio show, and, you know, I do the YouTube and, you know, the, the, the websites and stuff like this. And, and I know, guys, I've, I've fought these, these battles inside of me because I know some preacher around here could, could say, hey, today at 3 o'clock I'm going to get on Facebook Live and burp. They'll have 1,500 followers saying, Amen, Brother Burke, good. Amen, praise God. Oh, Jimbo, I get two views. You, you, you see what I mean? And you wonder, is God, does he even notice me? God, give us the gifts and make us important. We want the gifts. Why? To help people or be important. Remember James? He said you, you just want you just want that to, to consume it upon your own lust. What is that lust? It's the lust for power. Lust for power. And it all collapses and and and, and when it don't work. My expectations become unmet. And when my expectations become unmet, that's the fuel for anger. We get angry at God and say, God, you didn't come through. We prayed and nothing happened. We spoke words of faith. And the words of faith I spoke fell to the floor. Nothing. We claimed our city for God and yet drugs still rule. Claimed our family for God and yet... Still in jail. Now, you think I'm crazy about this stuff. Y'all remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist, the, the guy called of God to usher in the Lamb of God, to point the way and say, Behold the Lamb of God and baptize Jesus. He knew himself, Jesus, I have need to be baptized of you. And you want me to baptize you, Jesus? I mean, come on. He knew and he spoke words of truth. He got right in Herod's face and said, you're an adulterer. What did Herod do? Throw him in jail. John said, now wait, Jesus, you're the Messiah. I mean, surely you're going to come right on your, on your horses and chariots and a sword made in heaven and you're going to come down here. The scripture says with the, the, the breath of your lips you'll slay the wicked. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm captured by this wicked Herod who's committing adultery blatantly. Everybody knows it and I've told him. Now Jesus, come and vindicate me. Y'all remember that? Can you feel a little bit of John the Baptist here? What did John say? I mean, come on, Jesus. This is not what I thought power was. I mean, are you the Messiah? Because this doesn't look like you're the Messiah. Should we look for another? I don't know, Jesus. This ain't what I thought it was going to be. I'm in jail here. And they're going to cut my head off. This ain't what it's supposed to be. Do you remember what Jesus said? Go tell John. And do you know what he said? Jesus says, Blessed are them that is not offended. Scandal on in me. John, you got the wrong idea, John. You thought it was all this way, but John, please, don't, don't, don't let this scandal move you away. Believe in me, John. You've got the wrong view of power. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. John, you put power through the grid of human understanding. 
I'm not like that. Don't get offended. But we do. We get angry. Anger, that anger turns to apathy and despair. turns to boredom. Or we try to excuse God and, and we don't want God to get a bad name because we got to go around and take care of God's reputation, right? So we say, oh, the reason nothing happened was because it was an enemy attack. Or we say, well, there was sin in their life. That's, uh, that's why, you know, just like the miserable companies. Well, here's why it happened because you got sin in your life. Or, or as I hear on the radio all the time, uh, you got to have more faith. You got to have more faith. As soon as you get your faith right, then God can do something. You know, God's pretty hamstring right now because you don't, you know. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. We found the enemy. And he is us. Because God is not into our definition of power. Our ideal of power is the exact opposite of his. You remember Moses? Moses raised up in the house of Egypt, raised a prince, raised a general of the army, and you can look outside of the Bible and see Moses' accolades as being a general. I mean, here he is. He's a man raised up, educated. But now, he's gave all that up. Now he's a slave. What do you think Moses is thinking? I mean, he's got the word, right? God's going to deliver Israel through me. I mean, I do have the ability to organize. I've got the ability to cause a rebellion. I'll get these slaves to rise up, and we'll get a rebellion, and we'll overthrow Egypt, and I'll lead them out. I know how to do it. And when he come out there and saw an Egyptian busting on a little Israelite, Moses says, now's my chance. And he got up, and he slew the guy. You ever read it in Acts? When Stephen's preaching, Stephen says... And Moses supposed. Moses has an ideal of power and he supposed this is the way it's going to be. And you know how many people followed Moses? Zebra. His picture got put up on every post office in Egypt and he left Dodge and it took him 40 years to get over this scandal. 40 years Moses lived on the backside of the desert because of everything he knew of power didn't work. You with me? <coughs> How about Naaman? Remember Naaman? Naaman, it says, was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. A great man. A great man. A man of power. He was a leper. And a little old girl unnamed... A little maid, we don't even know her name, a little ordinary slave girl, ordinary church member filled with the glory of God says, oh, great man, great Naaman, would to God you knew about Elisha back down there because he could heal you. We don't even know her name. Can't wait to get to heaven and find out what her name is. It's pretty cool. We will know her name. So, so here goes Naaman down to see the prophet Elisha. And you can, as the scriptures goes, he's playing the movie in his head. You guys ever play the movie in your head? <coughs> I mean, sometimes I play church services in my head. Sometimes I play all kinds of things in my head. I'm play Naaman is playing the movie in his head. I'm a great man. I'm going down to see the God. I mean, to them, the God of Israel was Elisha. That was their view. And he could just see two gods meeting right here. Naaman, the God of Israel. And he'll come out with his fantastic robes and the red carpet and the doves will be flying out around his feet and he'll be glowing and he'll wave his hand over me and I'll be healed. This will be awesome. And he goes down with his pomp and he takes silver and he takes gold and he comes down and he arrives at the house of Elisha. This is going to be awesome all again. That's what he said. This is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see what. I can't wait to see what the God of Israel looks like, man. He's going to come out. Me and him are going to become friends. He knocks on the door. Out comes a little servant, dude. Can I help you? I'm Naaman, the Lord of the host of the army of the king of Syria. 
I'm here to see the God of Israel, Elisha. Uh, hang on there a second. Let me see if he's home. Goes back in the house, comes back out about five minutes later. Ah, uh, yeah, he's here. He said, go dip seven times in Jordan. The scripture says Naaman was wroth. That means he was full of anger. What? This is not the movie I played in my head. This is not my ideal of power. Surely there's better rivers to go dip in. I mean, but surely I thought he would come out, wave his hand, and I would hear the doves cooing, and, and you know, all these things would go on. But no, I don't even, he don't even come out. He don't even recognize me. Do you, do you read the scriptures that way, God? Just, just. I mean, he thought Elisha was a great wizard. That's what they did. He thought it was a great wizard. He's going to do this and that. Oh, you think that's just stuck in the Old Testament. How about Peter? Jesus tells them, you know what, guys? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be spit on. They're going to pull my beard out. They're going to beat me to a pulp and crucify me. What does Peter do? No. No. Jesus, that's not my deal of power. Far be it. That's what Peter says. Far be it. We ain't allowing this to happen. This ain't going to happen, Jesus. You've lost it. You've been in the communion wine a little too long. You've lost it. I'll go ahead, Jesus, and I got my sword, and I'll go ahead. What did Jesus say? Peter, you got it wrong. He says, get behind me, Satan. Listen to what Jesus said. He says, thou art an offense to me. Thou art a scandal on to me. Peter, you got it all wrong. You're interpreting the power of God and the kingdom of God through the grid of men's understanding. You realize the great promises that Paul wrote? you know where he wrote them from? He didn't write them from some grand cathedral. He wrote them from prison. Paul says you're more than conquerors. He wrote from a Philippian jail. I can do all things through Christ. He wrote in jail. We want to introduce Jesus as power. We want to introduce Jesus as somebody we can be proud of, right? President of Microsoft. He's, he's big. He's smart. He knows it all. He, he turns up with tax collectors on his team. I mean, what kind of person is this? I mean, go back in the scriptures and, and uh, say you're starting a ministry with Jesus. You get on Jesus' ministry team. You've watched him heal some people. People are starting to follow. This is cool. We're going to have the biggest church around. And he gets Matthew, a stinking, low-down, dirty, rotten, worst tax collector in the whole of Israel... He gets that guy to get on the ministry team. Of all people, we know Matthew. We don't even call him a man. He's a dog. I mean, well, Jesus, I guess we'll let Matthew on here. And then finally one day, here comes a rich young ruler. Good. We're going to get a little money. Our finances are running a little low. We're going to get a rich young ruler. Here he comes. He wants to join the traveling ministry. Cool. Man, we're going to get some new donkeys with this money this guy's going to put into the ministry. We're going to upgrade. This is going to be fantastic. And Jesus says, go and sell all that you have. Don't give it to me. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Jesus, what in the world are you doing? We could get new fishing boats, new net. We could spread the gospel with this man's money. God surely put it in his heart to come and give us all this money. And you tell him to go give it to the poor? You see, it's a scandal. It's a scandal. 
Then Jesus, one Sunday, he, or one Saturday, I guess, or Friday, I don't know what day of week it was, he begins to preach his sermon. Man, he's got crowds as far as the eye can see. And Jesus stands up and says, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. They said, What did he just say? I ain't listening to this crazy preacher no more. Jesus, I mean, come on. We got through the scandal of Matthew. We got through the scandal of the rich young ruler. And you stand up on Saturday and tell them at Sunday or Saturday morning church service, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Look at us now. We're, everybody's gone. Even 12 of us left. Talk about a church split. What does Jesus say? Are you going to leave too? And Peter says, where else could we go? Now, we think he's speaking words of faith. He ain't speaking words of faith. He says, where else could we go? He's in despair. Holy despair. You got the words of life. I mean, you know, I truly go. They had the words of life. It's a scandal. Oh, how about the, the king of kings? King of kings is riding into Jerusalem. How? With a white horse with a golden chariot. He riding in on a borrowed donkey. Borrowed donkey. See, this ain't my ideal of power. I surely thought he'd come in a limo. Anyway, I mean, Kenneth Copeland's got a limo. Jesus better preach than Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland got two jets. Jesus got to borrow somebody's donkey to make a trip. Power of God. Scandalous. Make, uh, idolatry is making God in our image. And in the church today, we've done that. We want a God that's safe and that fits in and the kind of person that would make the world take notice. We make idols by not letting all the truth get through. We got selective hearing. You ever ask yourself, we talked about this a little bit, why did, why did Israel make a golden calf? You ever wonder why they did that? Why not make a golden anything else? They made a golden calf. And they didn't say, this is a God of Egypt. They said, this is the Lord God of Israel. They said, this is our God, a golden calf. Because they, they let through what they wanted. God is power. God is like a young bull. Look at his glory and his strength. A young, our God is power and glory. And look at him. What's it say? Money is power. Brute strength is power. We have the riches. You know, in the Bible it says that Jesus and these apostles, when they went around, they turned the world upside down. How did Paul and these guys turn the world upside down? Because of all our categories of strength and power and wisdom, it was all turned on its head. Jesus said, or you know, in Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. We read that the weakness of God is stronger than men. Jesus doesn't come to us as an eagle or a lion or a bear, but as a dear little lamb. A lamb as it had been slain. A helpless, harmless lamb. That's how he comes to us. You ever, you ever heard of a person? And look, have you guys on CNN or Facebook ever heard of a person being mauled by a baby lamb? Adult male, 45 years old, 247 pounds. Mauled by a three-pound petting zoo baby lamb. To sue the other day. You ever read that? I mean, we think it's funny. This is Jesus. The lamb, behold, the Lamb of God. Not behold the bear of God, the lion of God. The Lamb, a petting zoo, little baby lamb. The power of God on display, and here it is. Pilate. You remember Pilate? He's the symbol of, of Caesar. He's the symbol of the power of the world, the most powerful nation in the world, the Roman Empire. Pilate, Pilate stands there in his toga with a, with a crown on his head. He's the symbol of all power and strength. Jesus standing beside of him with his face smashed in. 
just beaten to a pulp and his beard pulled out and Pilate looks at him and says, are you a king? You see the contrast? This is what we think power is. This is how God showed his power. It's a scandal. It's a scandal. Hmm. That's why they said at the cross, if you're, if you're a king, if you're who you say you are, come down. That's not our view of a king hanging on a cross. I mean, come down. But here's Jesus loving the undeserving. He never said, get out of my way. He comes down as a servant who washes feet. He always says, don't be afraid. Peace. He never wanted to be an earthly king, earthly king. When they tried to make him king, he ran away. He's, he's God in the flesh, yet he pays taxes. You know, surely he would have been the guy who would have stand up and says, I am God in the flesh and I shall not pay taxes. He's paying taxes. That's how we met Matthew. I mean, Jesus was tempted by Satan with all the kingdoms of the world and refused. He couldn't be bought. He couldn't be manipulated. And he didn't manipulate others. He's not a salesman. It's not a tactic. He doesn't have a technique. Jesus just loved people. Promised them hardship. And when... I, I'm going to get to something controversial here. When people didn't follow him, you know what Jesus said? You'll get it. You're going to suffer. He never said that, did he? <laughs> he just wept over them. Begged them. He never came across as a big, important person. He always had time for people. He talked to a lady at the well. When he's interrupted, he answers the questions. There's something very relaxed about Jesus. He's not, a, he's not out to prove to anybody. Finally, one day, they arrange a meeting. All the Pharisees, they got this big meeting going on. We're going to get Jesus. We got him. We got to answer. The, we got to ask this guy a bunch of questions. So they, they gather up in his house, and they're all sitting around, and he's asking and, and uh, answering questions. They're asking him questions, and they're all sitting around. And then finally, plaster starts to fall, and hay starts to fall through the roof, and we don't know what's going on. The roof is caving in, and then all of a sudden, they let a guy down in, on a mat, a crippled guy. Y'all remember the story? Do you ever sit there in the audience and you, you're like, something's falling on my head. What is that? I mean, I see feet. They're letting their feet down. Somebody's coming down and what did Jesus do? He leaves the VIPs, gives peace and healing to the man. When Jesus was threatened, he didn't threaten back. He never says, if you don't know who I am, you're going to be judged for what you're saying about me. You guys are going to get it. What does Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. James and John, they know what power is all about. They go through Samaria. Jesus, I mean, good Lord, you see how these people treated you? We know who you are. Just tell us, Jesus, we'll call fire down. We'll burn this cut vicar town down. We'll burn it up. I mean, God, I mean, we don't have to put up. I mean, that's what God's going to do to the United States. And I mean, I heard the other day, God, I mean, all he needs is about three preachers to call fire down. It's going to burn it up. It's going to burn New York. It doesn't flood it. New Orleans, out. remember that? He sent a hurricane Katrina down there and blew all them up and killed all them people. God's mad. You just tell me the word and I'll speak a storm on them. Pow! What did Jesus say? You don't know what spirit you're of. You don't have no idea what power is. Jesus begins his great sermon, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God's, listen, God's power is not bigger than man's power. It's in a totally different category. It has nothing to do with man's power. That's why God's power is a scandal to us. It wasn't that, that God was all powerful, then chose to not be powerful. 
The weakness of Jesus is the power of God. And when we come up against this power, guys, it's a stone of stumbling or it's a rock of offense. And we're broken on the stone. And when we're broken, you, you come on, Jeff, I just a couple minutes. When we're broken, don't blame Satan or other people. The problem is we thought of God as a man and he's not a man. When we come up against the weakness of God and the foolishness of God, instead of walking away angry, I say, God, I don't understand. All I know is you have the words of life and I'm not leaving. I'll be broken, God, to understand. Have you ever been in that case? I'll be broken, God, I don't understand. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm not going anywhere. You have the words of life. And at that point, you can be broken. I don't understand how God loves me. It doesn't make sense that God should love people who don't deserve it. That's the weakness of God. I don't understand when I'm weak, I'm strong. I don't understand that. It breaks all my concepts of power. I don't understand love dying for his enemies. It's stronger than all the armies of the world. I don't understand it. So break, break me on what I don't understand. You ever say that to God? Break me on what I don't understand. I'm going to give you some signs here. How do I know if I'm operating on the human grid of earthly power in the name of Jesus? How do I know? When I've got formulas that guarantee God must do as I say, I'm operating far from the heart of God. When faith is a mixture of denial of reality and fantasy and blame shifting, when it doesn't work, you're far from the heart of God. You know what I'm talking about, blame shifting. you got sin in your life. You don't have enough faith, this or that. When my visions of the future, listen here, when my visions of the future and all the glorious things that God's going to do through me eclipse the blood, sweat, and tears and reality of what is in my path to do now and who is in my path now to minister to today. In other words, I can't see the people God has put before me today for all the multitudes of tomorrow. I'm far from the heart of God. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Because God will every day bring somebody into your world, some person, insignificant, ordinary person, for you to minister to, for you to be good to, for you to love with the love of God. But see, it ain't Sunday, so I can't do it. You see what I mean? Or they're just nothing. They'll open no doors for me. They're insignificant. I want to go... Love on somebody that can prosper me. When certain scriptures are avoided because they don't fit my ideal of God, beware. When you feel surges of grandeur and greatness and when you compare yourselves to others, glad I ain't like them. Glad I never did that. When you start to feel that, glad I never did that. You're living through the grid of earthly power, far from the heart of God. When you believe God has called you to a high profile of greatness, instead of being an ordinary desert bush filled with the glory of God, beware. When your whole bearing in life is out of my way, instead of how may I serve you, you're not operating out of the love of God. When your whole life is served me, instead of, may I wash your feet? When your reaction to others is, how dare you 
you do that to me? How dare you say that about me? God will get you. God will punish you. You're far from the heart of Jesus who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When you find your enemy in a ditch and you gloat and say, I told you. You don't know the love of God. The disciples lived with Jesus three years. They didn't know the heart of God. At the Last Supper, they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. What did Jesus do? He got down and washed their feet. What do we do? We pray God will open our eyes. And until you get the scandal, guys, you'll never know the power of God. God hanging on a cross is the power of God. The fact that the world hates you is proof you're the body of Christ. Let your unmet expectations of God break it. Don't walk away in anger. You remember, remember Joseph? I'm, I'm, I'm close right here. Remember Joseph back over there in the Old Testament? God gave him a dream. Your father, your mother will bow down. All your brothers will bow down. You're going to have power. Sure didn't look like it when he's thrown into a pit. Didn't look like it when he's sold to the Ishmaelites going down to Egypt to be a slave. Didn't look like it when he was a slave in Potiphar's house. Sure didn't look like it when Potiphar's wife lied on him and he's thrown in jail. Sure didn't look like it when he's left to rot down there in jail. But he learned. He didn't let the scandal break him. Always through the scriptures it says, And the Lord was with us. And the Lord was with us. He knew the Lord. He said, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I ain't got a clue, but I know you're with me. And I will, I will be broken. I will let it break me. You see what I mean? That's why Paul could then say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Guys, that doesn't mean I can do all things in the sense of earthly power. It means in whatever place I'm at, if I'm in jail, I'm, in, I'm content. I'm at peace. If I'm in, going through the middle of the storm, I'm at peace. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When the Holy Spirit comes, I shall have, I'll have power to be witnesses. That doesn't mean I go to Walmart and hand out tracts. The word witnesses means martyr. You know what a martyr is? A martyr means now you have the ability to lay your life down. It means that now that, that my life is no longer mine. I have the ability to give my life on the street. We all need to repent of all these trappings of power, especially money. We believe in money more than God. And I, Listen, let me, let me read you a scripture, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. You, you know this, this scripture here, Psalm 23. Listen to this. Try this out in the scriptures and see if this doesn't work. Money is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Money maketh me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. Money restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for I've got my debit card. MasterCard is my rod and my staff, and you comfort me. Money, you are the lifter up of my head. You see what I'm talking about, guys? Can I serve God in me? It's a scandal. It's a scandal of the cross. I'm going to quit right there, guys. I, I hope you'll come back. Because we're going we're gonna to go into another route next week. But I just want you to see, guys, when you don't understand, don't run away. Be broken. Fall upon the rock. When you lay hands on somebody and they don't recover, don't try to make excuses. God, I don't understand. 
I mean, haven't we asked those questions? We lay hands on people and they're not healed. And I don't understand. God, instead of trying to say, well, they got sin in their life. They got unbelief in their life. They got... I don't understand, God, and I'll be broken. I'm not running away, God. You, you have the words of life. I don't understand it, but I'm not going anywhere. That's what we got to do, guys. I don't understand why this. I don't understand why this preacher prospers. I know what he's doing. I don't understand it, God, but I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not quitting. I'm just going to be broken. I don't understand, God. I, I spoke over these people. They're still mean as a snake, doing the same. They're still on drugs. I don't understand it. But you know what? God, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be broken. Just break me, God. Pray that the God would open the eyes of our understanding. Open our heart. That's the only way. And until we know the scandal, we don't know the power of God. God bless you.